Let's go to him for prayer as we begin our new year. Lord, thank you so much for coming to earth and loving us enough to save us. We thank you for the great sacrifice at the cross. All of us uh, for the last uh, number of days here have been meditating and thinking about that incarnation, the miracle of coming to earth, condescending to become like us, experiencing life as we do, and then defeating our arch enemy, the devil. We're grateful, Father, for all of this that you did. And then to ascend back up on to your throne on high and to take that rightful place as the intercessor. So, uh, Lord, come to us this morning. Fill us with your spirit. Help us to be ready, Lord, uh, to hear your word and to do what your word says. Pray that you'd be with all those here, Lord, that have had a difficult year in many different ways here, suffered uh, various losses. We pray, Father, that uh, you'd be our, ga our great recompense. Uh, we, we depend on you, Lord, to lift our spirits and to help us through whatever trials and tribulations there are. You warned us that in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. For I have overcome the world. So thank you for all of this, Lord. We pray that the joy of Jesus will be ours today and throughout this year, Lord. And that uh, we will soon be liberated to do our ministry, Lord, and to get back uh, in doing those things which we have been called to do. In the meantime, Lord, help us to meditate in your word, to grow daily, and to love you more and more as the, as the days pass on. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All the people said. Amen. All right. You said it through your mask so I can hear you. All right. So we also have a congregational song here. Um, this is going to fit in with our theme, which is the resurrection of Jesus. We have the text before us in Luke chapter 24. I want you all to find your place in your Bible. And it's all about uh, resurrection, the power of his resurrection. And this song is about, uh, well, it's called the Easter song. So, you know, we didn't get Easter this year, did we? I mean, we couldn't meet on Easter morning. So I'm hoping we'll be able to meet this Easter. What do you think? Uh, yes. What's Dr. Fauci tell us? I'm not quite sure, so we'll find out. Uh, we'll find out. I hope we can meet on Easter morning and uh, celebrate the greatest moment in human history. But actually, that's what we're doing every Sunday morning. It's all about the resurrection. The Easter song. Easter song.
Okay. Let's turn to Luke chapter 24. And we're going to start over uh, with the text. Uh, this is we, we really kind of got into this maybe three or four weeks ago, and um, there's lots, lots more to say, that's for sure. So we'll start at the first verse, and we're going to expatiate on most of these points again. So now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, uh, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them, and they found the stone rolled away, from the sepulcher. Now we're going to blend all the different uh, gospels. We have four gospels and each one uh, gives us a perspective and there, there are details in one that you might not get in the next. So we're going to blend those views together here in our studies. Uh, this is Mark's account. And uh, they said among themselves, who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and they found not the body of the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> and so it came to pass, as they were much perplexed, they didn't, couldn't figure this, how could this be? <laughs> they were much perplexed thereabout. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments, and as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living? Among the dead he is not here, but is risen as he said. That's a glorious expression right there. <laughs> He's not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Mark tells us then, when Jesus was risen early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. So uh, we want to we want to kind of go to Mary's experience first since she was the, the first recipient of the good news. So she arrives there apparently before all of the others earlier and uh, they're all having the same plan which is to come and anoint the body of Jesus. Now they didn't have enough time. Remember there was only three hours. He dies at three o'clock. They've got three hours to get him in a grave. Uh, because uh, Passover is about to be celebrated, and with that would mean a, a, a Sabbath, and there would be a Sabbath after Passover, and then of course the weekly Sabbath. So they had to hurry the matter up. So they got Jesus into the into the borrowed tomb of Joseph Arimathea. Everybody had to act rather quickly. Joseph had to go get permission from Pilate to be able to do all of this and so on. And meanwhile, the priests and the scribes that put Jesus on the cross and the Pharisees, they had to run and get permission to get a guard to surround the tomb so nobody would go and violate the tomb and steal the body of Jesus and say he was risen. So they had to make all of this. All this happens in three hours of time. Uh, Why well, it could never happen if, if uh, the United States Congress was involved. It would take uh, some, so much more time. But no, they were able to do it quickly and swiftly. And so <clears throat> Mary uh, is anxious to get to the tomb, but she has to wait out the Sabbath. The Sabbath ends with the setting of the sun. And uh, so there she's able now to come very early in the morning. It's still dark out. She gets to the tomb and uh, she finds the stone has been rolled away. And uh, of course, what has happened here and how, is, how has this occurred? She's going there to mourn perhaps and be there uh, before the other women come. There's another Mary that's going to come along here. There's Joanna, there's Susanna, there's a number of women, godly women that are coming with spices preparing and they want to actually anoint the body of Jesus. So she gets there and she finds the tomb has already been violated. It's opened. And uh, of course that also, she's perplexed by it. How could this have happened? We know the Romans the guards were there, but now they don't seem to be there. So what's going on here? So um, she gets there and she peers into the tomb and what does she find there but two angels. Now this account is different than what we're reading in Luke because this account in Luke does not record this appearance. Mary is the first one by herself and sees Jesus. So she sees and go, looks into the tomb. And what does she see inside the tomb, not outside of it? She sees two angels. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and she looked into the sepulcher and saw two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet 
where the body of Jesus had lain. Now this is a curious posture for them. In fact, uh, we find, we find uh, in Matthew's account that there is an angel sitting on the tombstone, actually, uh, that had been rolled aside. And apparently, uh, the other account, Luke's account, the ladies had gone into the tomb and then they turn about and here are angels giving them the message there. So uh, these are all different uh, descriptions of a similar event. At any rate, Mary goes into the tomb and she sees these two angels and they're juxtaposed from the head to the feet of Jesus. Now we might wonder what detail and why this detail is given and why it might be important. Let's not forget that John's gospel is a spiritual gospel. So there's always some kind of esoteric meaning behind anything that happens in the gospel of John. It requires some interpretation. And, uh, the, but the Bible doesn't require us to interpret it. We can just leave it as it is and it's a narrative and we can move on. But I'm wondering what is suggestive about this. And what to me is suggestive, isn't that the way the Ark of the Covenant was established? Jesus, after all, is the Ark of the Covenant. That's why we don't need one any longer. They're still searching for it, I think. They're still looking for it, aren't they? Or they find it in a movie, I think, somewhere. <laughs> but... Uh, Two cherubim were poised on top of the halostrum, which is the Greek word for the mercy seat. And we had two angels, both peering, looking inward toward the place where the atonement and the blood would be shed. And uh, they look at it rather curiously. Of course, this, is all, uh, this was all typology. It was a picture of something that was better to, that there was to come, and that was Jesus, who is our Ark of the Covenant. And we're now established with him, and we don't, uh, he's fulfilled all of what needs to be done to take away our sins, and has shed his blood to make it all possible. Aren't you glad this morning? So. At any rate, with those two angels kind of sitting between this um, niche that had been carved in the sepulcher, it almost is reminiscent of the Ark of the Covenant. And with the two angels looking curiously in at what had just taken place, all of them, of course, knowing who Jesus was, knowing that he is the everlasting God who has come to earth, all of this is a curious thing to them to redeem all of us from all of our iniquity and then to rise again in victory victory over death. And so they're there to announce that. There's no need for an Ark of the Covenant any longer. He's already come. And he's fulfilled the law that would have condemned us. And instead of it being a judgment seat, it now becomes a mercy seat. All right. So I think that's probably why we have the two angels uh, poised as they are here, juxtaposed here, uh, head and foot. And uh, Mary comes in to see what's going on. And uh, they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. So she's assuming somebody has now taken the body, somebody has stolen the body, and that these two angels perhaps, uh, they might not be in the same um, attribute, shining and so forth at this point. There seems to be something hidden about all of this. Or at least in her mind, perhaps she's not even looking, she's stooping down, she's not even perhaps looking at them, and she wants to know, where'd you take the body? Next thing, of course, in the Gospel of John, when she had uh, thus said, she turned herself back, and she saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? And she's supposing him to be the gardener, the superintendent of the graveyard, right? Saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus saith unto her, Mary. There's something beautiful about that, isn't there? Because he's going to call me by name and you by name one day. Did you know that? He knows his sheep by name. And he's going to call your name. Maybe it'll be this week. He's going to say, come up hither. I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And we'll go up. And uh, it'll be an excitement to be able to hear the Lord uh, call our name and say, "Come." well, you know, every once in a while when I'm visiting people at 11 o'clock or 1130 on a morning, they might have the television on. And I noticed that there's still on television a program that I remember as a kid. It was called The Price is Right. 
It's still on. I mean, so it's, uh, when, when I watched it, it was Bill Cullen. He was the host. Now I think it's Bob Barker. Or somebody like Bob Barker, I forget. <laughs> At any rate. And uh, what do they do? How do they, they said, come on down, don't they? They name your name, you're out in the audience, and these people come down. I've never seen people so excited. And they jump up and down, they scream, and they run down and kiss Bob Barker or whoever it is now that's doing the show, right? And they're all thrilled about it, excited, because they come on down, whether they're going to win or not. But you know, the Lord's going to call your name, and He's going to say, come on up. And that's going to be even more thrilling, isn't it? Yeah. So you're not going to win a refrigerator no. or, or whatever they have. You know, they have consolation prizes. or Sometimes they have bad prizes, right? You win something like a donkey with a cart. When we get up to heaven, oh, there's not going to be any disappointments when we get there. I can tell you that right now. Come on up, the Lord will say, and he'll call you by your name. So how personal it is. Mary, he said, and that's all she needed to hear. She heard Jesus say her name. She turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, a rabbi in other words, great teacher, uh, which is to say master. And uh, Jesus saith unto her, touch me not, I have not yet ascended to my father. Now the Greek scholars tell us here that the word touch me not means continue not touching me, the tense that it's in. And apparently she had fallen at his feet, and who won't when you see Jesus, and he calls your name, you'll fall at his feet, I'll fall at his feet, and uh, we won't be asking him any questions, why did I do this or that, why did I lose my job, or why did my wife die, or why did uh, my children get sick, or you won't ask him any questions. You'll be glad to see him. Amen. And everything's resolved as soon as he says your name. That's all that we're waiting for is he's going to call our name and we'll be up there in glory land. Won't that be something? So we'll fall at his feet. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We do it willingly. The lost will do it, of course, grudgingly. So um, she's, she's no doubt at his feet holding and uh, touch me not. In other words, do not continue this because I have, I, I have something I need to do or accomplish. He needs to go to heaven at this point. He's going to make a journey up to heaven. He's going to ascend. And, and John's gospel tells us all about that. So, um, so here he tells her, gives the word out. I am not yet ascended unto my Father. So he's resurrected. He uh, has a glorified body, but he has not yet ascended. He's going to ascend up into glory and be at the right hand of God. So uh, I ascend unto my Father and your Father. Now that's a glory, isn't it? I'm going to my Father, but he's also your Father. We've been adopted. We're into the family of God. You weren't born a Christian. You were adopted into his family. The book of Galatians tells us all of this. And what an adoption. What does that mean? It means, of course, that you have the right to inheritance. We're joint heirs with Christ, Romans 8 says. So whatever Christ is going to inherit, we're going to inherit. And if I understand it correctly, he's going to inherit this cursed world of ours, and he's going to change it into a world sans curse. There'll be no curse. And we're going to come back and rule and reign with Christ a thousand years. So that'll be great, won't it? Uh, I'm taking control of Wilkins Township. Yep, that'll be it. And I'm casting all the politicians out. There'll be no building inspectors. Not going to have any of those problems, right? No zoning issues and so on. I'm in charge now, see? Well, I don't know what it means to rule and reign with Christ, but I can tell you what it's going to be. It's going to be exciting, I can tell you that. Whatever God has for us, got to be better than anything that this world can have to offer. So, so our consolation, there's a consolation. When you follow Jesus, if you suffer in this world, you lose something in this world, you'll gain it in the world to come. So uh, there's really no loss ever. So God, he said, I'm going to go to my father and your father, to my God and your God. How personal it is. So, Mary then runs back to give the word out. It's going to give the word out to the uh, apostles, the 11. Now, Judas has hung himself. So, we've got the 11 apostles, and they're up in the upper room. They're all locked in, scared to death that they're going to be crucified next. 
and Mary comes uh, rapping at the door. She's got the greatest news the world has ever heard. He is risen. And she's the first one to bring the Holy Evangel to the apostles. Now, of course, our text tells us about the other women as well and kind of collectivizes, to puts them all together as though they all came at the same time. I think Mary precedes them, at which point uh, the others come following because they also had a divine meeting with Jesus. Uh, they came into the tomb after Mary, apparently. Angels are there, as we're reading now in our account. And the angels say, why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here. And uh, they go back to give the message out as well. And they all arrive in this upper room to tell the eleven that Jesus is risen. And that's what we find here in the ninth verse. And they returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven. And all the rest. So there were more than just eleven gathered up there. Those were the faithful ones. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and other women that were with them which told these things unto the apostles. So here they are, Joanna, Mary the mother of James the less and other women. So we know Susanna was one of them and there were others that are, are anonymous to us but we know that they were very faithful. You know, all the men were cowering somewhere in an upper room and the ladies were there at the cross watching the whole event and then at the tomb to do a proper anointing of the body. So uh, we give them great credit here. And so Jesus appears to them, would have appeared to anybody that would have shown up at the grave, but uh, only, uh, only these came. But I put up here that they were faithful witnesses to the resurrection, but it was received with incredulity. In other words, nobody believed them. The eleven and all that were gathered in that room. We don't know how many there were. It could have been as many as a hundred, uh, like the book of uh, Acts tells us. So there could have been a lot of people there. And nobody's believing their story. Now isn't that something? Yeah. Jesus entrusts the greatest message the world has ever heard to these ladies. And these ladies come in the room and they're, they're not believed. Their message is rejected. Perhaps there were some that skeptically said, well, you know, they're, they're emotional women here. They think they saw something they didn't really see. And so any, any of you ever been accused by skeptics about, you know, you believe in something, an invisible man and the clouds and all this sort of thing? They mock you, don't they? That Joy Behar, is that her name, who is on The, the View, yeah. mocked uh, Vice President Pence. Uh, when the coronavirus uh, started there in March, he uh, uh, formulated a prayer circle in the White House to pray about wisdom as to how, what to do with this virus and so on. And she got on and mocked praying. What good is your praying going to do? You know, and so the skeptic mocks God and mocks the whole idea of an invisible, immortal creator that we all owe our life and allegiance to. So uh, people mock you, and uh, that's all right if they want to do that, because after all, they need some evidence, apparently. And, um, you know, if God is merciful to them, they'll, they'll get their evidence eventually. So that's what we have to hope for. We weren't all born believers, were we? We were skeptics to some degree and rationalists, and it took a while for us to believe. We'll get to that in just a bit. So here they are giving out, and it says, uh, uh, and, and other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles, and their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Just fables, that's all. What's uh, something you're imagining in your head? You're hoping that Jesus is alive, but he's as dead. We saw him die on the cross. He's, uh, we're not believing the story. Not believing the message of the resurrection. Beloved, that's the difference between heaven and hell right there. Uh, Romans chapter 10 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So right now, you have to say they were unsaved. They rejected it. They heard the message from faithful witnesses, eyewitnesses, and still didn't believe it. Uh, John's Gospel says it, uh, it kind of identifies Mary's 
uh, time that she came, preceding the others, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna we found in our text and put the collective witness together here of all those that came and their words seemed to them as idle tales and they believed them not. And uh, she went and told them that uh, had been with him as they mourned and wept and when they heard that he was alive and had been seen of her believed not. So uh, incredulous. Well, it, it was an incredible thing. Three days, three nights in a tomb. To the Jew, that meant you were surely dead. Those that Jesus had raised from the dead, with the exception of Lazarus, they were freshly dead. But Jesus proves that he has power over the grave itself and uh, is risen indeed. There are two other witnesses that we're going to be reading about here shortly that also came with the same word. Cleophas, and uh, you can guess who the second person is. I'm going to put James the less here, and I'll explain that in a little bit. You know, there were two James, James, of course, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. So that's James the apostle that everybody uh, kind of primarily thinks of, you know, when it's Peter, James, and John, that holy triumvirate. James the less is another James. These are very common names, as they are today. So you could find a number of uh, people that were named uh, James. So, uh, and Judas, for instance, there were uh, two Judases in the 12. So after that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went out of the country. And they went and they told it unto the residue that neither believed they them. So now you've got this witness here, you've got a retinue of witnesses all saying the same thing, corroborating that they had seen Jesus. He was risen from the dead and they still wouldn't believe them. So then arose Peter and ran into the sepulcher. Apparently he does this at some point after hearing Mary Magdalene and uh, stooping down, he gets to the, uh, the tomb. He beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed wondering in himself. Peter, you must believe us. Now there was something that he saw in that tomb that convinced him that Jesus was risen indeed. So it changed him from uh, a doubter to a shouter, right? Something was there, some kind of evidence that indicated to him that Jesus was in fact risen from the dead. We go back to John's gospel and we get some of the clues. So Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple, that would be John, and came to the sepulcher and they ran both together and uh, the other disciple out, out, did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. That would be John. Um, he uses, uh, writes the gospel in a third person anonymously. Uh, but he's speaking of himself at this point. The other disciple. He also calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. So all of those were, those are indicators. John's uh, letting you know it's, it's, it's he of which he speaks. He gets there, apparently outruns Peter, gets there first, but won't go into the tomb. Too sacred a moment. What do they say, the old expression, the fools rush in where angels dare not trod. So uh, John stops and uh, stops at the door, peers in, stooping down, looking into the tomb, but does not go in. Peter gets there, as we would expect, and ignores all, all uh, probability here of, of, of danger and just rushes right into the tomb and looks. And both of them become convinced after what they saw in that tomb that Jesus was indeed risen and that the report of Mary Magdalene and the other Marys and, the, uh, and Joanna and the other women 
and uh, the two that came that saw him, all of that witness was credible because of what they saw. So he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet he went not in. Peter therefore went forth, the other disciple, and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did unrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. He, stooping down, looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulcher, and saith the linen clothes lie. And the napkin, which was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself, they went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. All right, there's a lot to take, uh, to take in here in this particular text, but what was it that they saw? What, Peter, what did Peter and John see when they got in there that convinced them? And I think the answer to that is the talent. They saw the talent. They saw it as referred to here as a napkin or a covering that went over the face. And this was a traditional matter. Uh, and to some degree, it's still uh, performed today by Orthodox Jews, where they actually wrap the corpse in the person's talit. Now, a talit was a shawl that you would put, a prayer shawl. Uh, when Jesus, for instance, was teaching in the temple, he would put the talit over his head and would cover his head in that fashion. This was a sacred article and it was kept for a lifetime. And it was given to the son at bar mitzvah and he would keep that and treasure that all the days of his life. Um, so, uh, and in fact, this talit um, would have uh, tassels at the end of it and so on. And when the person died, they'd cut those tassels at the end and indicating that his life had now ended. So um, they found this talit wrapped up and lying apart from the other grave clothes. And that convinced them that Jesus was risen because every Jewish man took very special care of his talit. And in fact, he had his own way of folding it. When I do a um, funeral for a veteran, the, uh, at the end, they'll take the flag from the coffin and uh, they will take great pains. You'll see two soldiers taking and wrapping it together in a certain way and folding it in triangular fashion. And it takes uh, about four minutes, five minutes uh, to do this ritual. Uh, and then they take the, uh, the flag, and one salutes the flag, then the other takes it, and the other salutes the flag, and then they give it to the widow uh, and say, in behalf of a grateful nation, and so on. So you can see they took great pains with that flag. You know, it was a symbol of the person, the veteran that served our country. So uh, very similarly, the talent meant something as well. So they would bury the person with the talent. But now they found that when they got to the tomb, they found not what they expected to find. Now, this talent would have been a kind of a covering that would go over the body. The body itself was wrapped. It was wrapped like a mummy would be wrapped. They had learned this in Egypt when Joseph was there and he was, he was brought up out of Egypt to be buried in the promised land. That was his wish and desire. And they wrapped his body and they would take strips of cloth and they would dip it in aloes and cinnamon and spices and so on. And then they would wrap the body all the way around the body so that it, you look like a mummy, essentially. And then after all that was done, they would wrap you up to your armpits. Then they would place the talent over your body. And uh, that's, that was the formal way of burial. Now, of course, this, um, this talent, as I said, they must have seen it wrapped together in a place by itself. Wrapped together here, perhaps uh, maybe a, a choice of words here that thinks that it's, it sounds like it's untidy and some wrapped it and so forth, but they actually folded it. So in other words, who folded the, this talent? And who would have done it if they stole his body? And how would they know how to do it? Because each Jewish male had his own personal way of folding the talent. 
And when Peter and John saw, they had seen Jesus take the talent on and off many times and fold it uh, very carefully and place it down when it wasn't to be used and so on. And he had his way of folding it that would identify to them that Jesus had risen from the dead, took the time and the care to fold his talent and place it in a place by itself. That convinced them that he was indeed risen from the dead and not stolen. Of course, the other thing was, if somebody had stolen the body, then they would have seen the grave clothes or these wraps that I was talking about, these strips. I liken this to art class back in junior high school. I had Mr. Lessick right up the street here at Bokens Junior, and we used to do uh, paper mache in the art class. So um, we would take and cut newspapers up, long strips, and we'd dip it in wheat paste, and then you would take either chicken wire and form something out of chicken wire, or you could just take a balloon if you wanted to form a circle, and you just wrap around the chicken wire or the balloon, and then you would let it dry. And after it would dry, you could pop the balloon. It didn't matter now because it would hold its shape now. It was formed after the wheat paste would dry. So what did they see that convinced them that Jesus' body wasn't stolen? Because had it been stolen, to get the body out of the wrapping, they would have had to have torn all of those strips of cloth off instead. I believe that they saw a shell, a perfectly formed shell of the body of Jesus with no body in it. And that that would have been a convincing moment for them that when they went as skeptics and thought somebody indeed has stolen his body, once they saw this, they know that no one could have stolen it in that fashion. So that's what I think they saw when they got into the tomb. The talent in a place by itself folded up the way Jesus would, and then his corpse, or the outline of his corpse, without a body in it, thus convincing them risen indeed. Now at first, at first they did not believe and the eleven did not believe as we've already seen here in these two texts they believed not. They heard the witness and they rejected it. But aren't you glad that God gives people second chances? Uh, well, I'm not asking for a show of hands but how many times did it take for you to hear the gospel for you and finally to get your, through your thick head, right? <laughs> or thick heart, it took a time, didn't it? Amen. Maybe you had to hear the gospel several times before it finally began to penetrate the external and to get into your heart. That's why it's so vital to get people to church to hear the Word of God. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. And the more exposure that a person has to the Word of God, the stronger their faith will become. And they'll begin to realize and pass over. It doesn't have to be a dramatic moment, but a person finally says, I believe this. I understand it. I see it now. And so many people I know have come here to this church and have said, look, all their life they went to church, they believed that Jesus was the Savior and so on. But it wasn't until they heard the Word of God as it was expounded and taught that it began to settle in their mind that this is the truth and they embrace it. I'm glad that God gives not just second chances, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, tenth, right? You, some of you folks there should be dead, right? <laughs> Our God is the God of second chances. Ask Jonah. Jonah got a second chance, didn't he? He disobeyed God, ran for it, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't do what God wanted him to do and the word of the Lord then came unto Jonah. It says the second time. This time, of course, Jonah was more than willing to follow God's orders. He'd already been swallowed by the great fish, already been carried nearly halfway across the Mediterranean Sea, and then brought back again and vomited out on the beach. And at that point, you're willing to say, uh, what was it you want me to do, Lord? And you were willing then, see? God gives people second chances. Samson is certainly an illustration as well. And in many ways he was a type of Christ, mighty and strong, and yet he failed in so many other areas as well, particularly with the women. And what happened ultimately is that God uh, led him uh, foolishly, gave up his uh, Nazarite vow, all for the love of a woman, and ended up losing his eyesight and losing his strength and power with God. But God uh, came back to him a second time. And he prayed at the, he said, Lord, hear me this one time. 
and avenge me of my adversaries, the Philistines, uh, for my two eyes. And God heard him, and God sent strength to him, and he slew more Philistines in his death than he did in his life. The case of Peter. Peter who said and swore, I will follow you to the cross, I will die with you. And what happens but he gets the opportunity and uh, as they take Jesus in for trial, he stands by the fire warming himself and the citizens uh, came to him and said, oh, you're one of uh, those disciples, aren't you? Oh, he said, I don't know who you're talking about, Jesus. And swore that he didn't know Jesus three times had the opportunity. And what did God do? You would say, well, at that point you just cast somebody aside, but not our Lord. Our Lord comes to him after his resurrection, appears to him personally, and also at the Sea of Galilee, and asks him three times, Simon Peter, lovest thou me more than these? And he said, Lord, you know I love you. And he said, feed my sheep. So he got a second chance, and we know that Peter then became uh, the first oracle for the Lord in the New Testament era. How about this woman in John chapter 8? And uh, of course, if you have modern translations, they've erased chapter 8, verses 1 through 7. So, uh, but I, I'm leaving it in my Bible. If I, if I were you, I'd leave it uh, alone. So uh, here we've got this woman, and uh, she's about to be condemned to death. She deserves it. That's what the Bible says for adulterers. She's an adulteress. We don't know. I think it takes two to commit adultery. Uh, but there's only the woman at this point, so we can understand there was some kind of political game that was being played here. So only the woman is taken, and they're ready to stone her to death. And she, uh, according to Mosaic jurisprudence, that was the punishment. We'd have a lot of dead people today. And Jesus, of course, disperses the crowd. You that have not sinned, cast the first stone. They're all gone. Woman, where are your accusers? There are none, Lord. Neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. What a great opportunity. And that woman becomes a, a saved life. And I have to believe a changed life. To go now and say, I won't be what I once was. God gives us the great chance. There's no program on earth that can give you that kind of a, a, a guarantee. Most of the programs today say, well, this is who you are. You're an alcoholic. You'll always be an alcoholic. You're a drug addict. You'll always be a drug addict. Ask the judges. That's what they believe. I don't believe one word of it. I believe God changes people's lives. And if a person loves the Lord with all their heart, that God gives them a new heart, gives them new disposition, gives them power over the sin that so easily took them before. Now they've got power. They can, they can, in the name of Jesus Christ, walk right past the bar room or the dope den or the prostitute's house. Right? I think that's... Then, of course, we've got John Mark who uh, departed from Paul. This, the, the heat was too great in the kitchen, so he got out. He said, there's too much persecution going along with this gospel. So he leaves them and departed them from them in Pamphylia. You'll read this, of course, in Acts 15. Uh, this is about 52 A.D. Later, as Paul is about to die in 2 Timothy, he says, take Mark and bring, with him, uh, bring him with you because he's profitable to me for ministry. So he gave him a second chance. And, uh, of course, only the Lord can give those second chances. The psalm that we're all so familiar with, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He restores my soul. Everybody that's redeemed in this room, their soul has been restored, reclaimed. Rede redeemed and ransomed, as we heard in the song. And that's what brings such joy to us. Now, I always use this illustration, restoring here. And only those here that uh, are high-tech people would understand what I'm saying, I guess. But if you have iTunes, you know that every once in a while your phone might go bad and your iPods might go bad and they don't work anymore. Now, what do you do? Well, then you go online, you plug it in, and it says, uh, problem with your iPhone requires it to be updated or restored. You see that? And you say, well, that, that sounds good. Yeah, he's going to fix it. <laughs> and so, uh, what do you say? Well, you say, well, update it, right? Not only do you say it, you're willing to update it, and then all of a sudden another window comes up and says, are you sure you want to restore the, the phone, right, to its factory settings? Because if you do this, your media and all your data will be erased. Aww. Wow. 
and you're thinking to yourself, do I want to do this or not? And well, you have no choice because your device isn't working anymore. So of course, unless you're very wise and backed up all of your device, what you do after you've done this one time and foolishly didn't, <laughs> You finally push that button, don't you? I mean, you wait a little while and you think about it. And then you say, okay, restore. Restore. And what does God do? He restores you. Look, God's saying you want a new life? You've got to give up on the one you have. You've got to realize it's a loser's proposition here. You've got to come to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm a broken person. I'm a person, I'm weak. I need the help of the Lord. I can't live this by myself. And uh, that's what I believe in. You know, um, I remember talking, this was years back, uh, but uh, to a judge. And the judge said, Reverend, you're throwing your life away trying to reach these guys in jail and so forth. They, they're, uh, they can't be reformed. And uh, I mean, I don't think he should be a judge if he has that position, right? They can't be reformed. But you see, it becomes so bitter. And after so many years of people telling them stories and this, I'm going to do this and I'm going to, they don't believe it anymore, right? Uh, it's so sad for, I would never want to be a judge, that's for sure. But, uh, and I, I said, look, I, I have living proof. I see people that I know that have already been written off who are living lives of victory. They're not perfect people, but they're living in victory now. They're not bound to this old life. And they've been restored by the only one who can restore you. The repairer, you talk about a name in Isaiah 58. It's the Lord. Thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the broken part of our life, the breach, and the restorer of right paths to dwell in. <laughs> so that's who he does. He's a restorer and a repairer. Thank God, right? You know, I've got a, a poem. I left it in my briefcase. I'll see you later. <laughs> oh. oh man, it's written in. I might have to get some glasses here. Uh oh. Okay, this is it's entitled the the land of beginning again. Uh, so. I wish there were some wonderful place called the land of beginning again. Where all our mistakes and all our heartaches and all our poor selfish griefs could be dropped like a shabby old coat at the door and never put on again. I wish we could come on all its, uh, I, I wish we could come on it all unaware, like the hunter who finds a lost trail. And I wish that the one for whom our blindness had done the greatest injustice of all could be at the gate like the old friend that waits for the comrade he's gladdest to hail. We would find the things we intended to do but forgot and remembered too late. Little praises unspoken, little promises broken, and all of the thousand and one little duties neglected that might have perfected the days of one less fortunate. It wouldn't be possible not to be kind in that land of beginning again. And the ones we misjudged and the ones whom we grudged their moments of victory here would find the grasp of our loving hand clasp more than penitent lips could explain. For what had been hardest, we'd know had been best, and what had seen loss would be gain. For there isn't a sting that will not take wing when we've faced it and laughed it away. And I think that the laughter is most what we're after in that land of beginning again. So I wish that there were some wonderful place called the land of beginning again, where all our mistakes and all our heartaches and all our poor selfish griefs could be dropped like a ragged old coat at the door and never put on again. Well, that's how the poem ended. But a Christian read this and added a final paragraph. There is a wonderful place for the whole human race called the land 
a beginning again. Where the acts of the past in forgiveness cast, rise no more, for God's pardon we gain. And the Savior we find, who will always be kind, as the King of our hearts, He shall reign. And though sin sick and sad, we will always be glad in that land of beginning again. Hallelujah. Yes, indeed. Hallelujah. Now I have five minutes left. How could this be happening? So I'm going to begin with the text of the two men on the road to Emmaus. And we'll have to come back tonight to get, I think, a very important lesson. So behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. I always like to uh, give us some kind of orientation. So, uh, so they're in Jerusalem. They've witnessed the death of Jesus Christ. And uh, they're leaving town. They're leaving Jerusalem. This might be a bad place, they're thinking, for disciples of Jesus to remain. So they head to their homes. Uh, and that, of course, is in Emmaus. Now, it depends on how you want to calculate a furlong, but we'll say 520 feet. Uh, so 60 furlongs is what it says here in the text. That would be 500 uh, uh, times 520 feet would be 31,200 feet, uh, which would be about 15 and a half miles. And there's three locations that people have said that might be where uh, Emmaus is. You can choose any one if you'd like. I'm not really... That, I don't think it's that important. <laughs> they haven't really found it. They claim that they found one um, that they think is probably the closest. But it's just a little village, that's all. And they're headed back to the village. There was no reason now to stay on. The master had been slain, the hope of a kingdom gone, uh, their prospects of a future cabinet role where they might rule with the Messiah. That's all just a dream to them now. And now they have to go back to the life of toil and labor and whatever it might have been, the mundane experience, before they had met Jesus. So here they are, two of them, road to Emmaus, uh, discussing the things that had happened, lamenting. And as they lament, came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. You know, you and I are on a lonesome path here sometimes, aren't we? Uh, it seems like all hope's gone. Everything's dashed to pieces. Maybe even they're wondering, why would God let this happen to his own son? Whatever they're musing, there's no resolution. These people, their heart is sad, their countenance is sad, there's no more joy. And just as they're walking down the road, Jesus draws near to them. Haven't you noticed that? Now some of you probably have a plaque somewhere in your house, footprints, right? Everybody knows footprints? And that's that guy complaining, you know, he said, here we were, Jesus, footprints, my footprints, we're walking along the beach, all of a sudden you left me. You're not there when I needed you the most. I had to go through life, where were you when I needed you? And you might remember the uh, ironic twist to the, uh, that little statement, and that was that I, that's uh, when you see the one set of footprints, that's when I lifted you up and picked you and took you the rest of the way. And so Jesus is drawing near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. Now this is a mysterious thing. We don't know. There's not enough explanation as to what was this all about. They, they, they couldn't see. Were they blinded? Obviously they weren't blinded. But their eyes were holden. So what does holden mean that uh, their eyes would be holden all of a sudden? So it came to pass, while they communed together in reason, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were holding that they should not know him. I'm going to use this text in Mark 16. When they uh, had uh, gone back, you know, to announce that they had seen Jesus, after he had appeared in another form, it says, unto the two of them, another form. 
So uh, there was some kind of mystery about how he garbed himself or some form that he took that it wasn't immediately obvious to them that it was Jesus. Now the one man that's here, his name is Cleopas. He's identified in the text. The other we're going to get to. As we've talked about the God of second chances, there's a blind man that we find here. He cometh to Bethsaida to bring uh, a blind man uh, unto him and besought him to touch him. And he took him, the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And uh, he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. And after that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. The second chance, the second touch. Wow. In other words, these men, their eyes were holding, but they were getting another chance. The Lord was about to reveal himself to them in a rather cryptic manner. Right now, it wasn't going to be by sight. It was only going to be by faith, by what he was saying to them that would finally revive their hearts, and their hearts would burn within them. I wish I could go on, and I will, but you'll have to come back at 7 o'clock to hear the rest. But what a story. Let's pray. So, Lord, here we are. Uh, at this moment in time, um, I think it's a curious moment, Lord, the people celebrating a new year. Often people uh, make some promises and pledges, resolutions they call them. But Lord, uh, so trivial, most people forget what they promised. But Lord, you're a God of second chances. There is with you a land of beginning again. And we want to begin first, Lord, by confessing our failures and our sins to you. You know all about them, Lord. You know what we've done, what we've said, how we've acted, Lord, reprehensibly and disobediently. Uh, we've lived our lives as though we have ignored you for most of our life, as though you were not even there. We've even used your name in vain. Lord, can you forgive us and give us a second chance here? We'd like to begin again with you, Lord. And this time, we want to make it right. We want to live a life that is worthy of the vocation wherewith you have called us. So forgive us, Lord. Cleanse us of all our foolishness. Save us, Lord. You went to the cross to do that. You shed precious blood to redeem us. You gave up your life so that we could live a life of victory. Thank you, Lord, for this gracious gift. Now we open our hearts to receive it. We pray your blessing upon us here. Lord, not only did you die, but we know as we're reading that you rose again in great power. You ascended up on high where you now at the right hand of God have become a mediator for us. And you will placate the wrath of the Holy Father in heaven. And you will make that Father our Father and our God. So we invite you into our heart. We ask for your forgiveness. We pray, Lord, that we will, with the power of Christ, live a life more pleasing to you and ultimately to all of us. We love you, Lord, and thank you. Pray for a good blessing in this coming year. We pray that it will be an exciting and uh, prosperous year in the things of Jesus Christ. Lord, we're not asking for monies and wealth or even health. We're asking for the direction of the Almighty. We pray the will of God to be done in our lives in this coming year. Lord, help us to uh, be faithful to our attendance at church, to hearing the word where we can grow thereby. We pray, Lord, that the doors of ministry will open again to us and that we can accomplish the will, Lord, and to tell the good news, even though we have those about us that are quite incredulous, that we can uh, somehow, Lord, convince them by consistent Christian living and loving that Jesus is alive. We thank you, Father, for all that you have done and what you accomplished. We pray, Father, that this finished work will reside in our hearts now and for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless all of you.
invite you to accept the plan of salvation that God has laid forth from the foundations of the earth. And the first point of that plan is that all have sinned. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So begin by confessing your sin before God, that you have sinned against Him. You can't even recollect all of the times that you've offended Him. He has the record, and that record needs to be expunged. Secondly, it's important to know that God will punish sin. If it goes without atonement, we will pay the ultimate price. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that eternal price is hell, fire, and brimstone. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. But Jesus paid the price and made the atonement on the cross. God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. He made an end to our damnation and our debt that we owed to him, paid by his own blood and justifies us before a holy God. On the third day, in triumph, Jesus rises from the dead. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So call upon him today. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus.